Since the beginning of human existence, we have faced many different viral threats, and some of these were quite deadly. Smallpox, for example, plagued humanity for centuries and was responsible for 300 million deaths in the 20th century alone. But luckily, due to an effective vaccine, smallpox was declared eradicated in 1980, with the last naturally occurring case recorded in 1977. Alongside smallpox, we faced other viral killers like HIV, with nearly 43 million lives lost since its discovery in the 1980s. But again, treatments and preventative measures have reduced these numbers. Now, as lethal as some of these viruses are, and even with all the attention the most recent infamous respiratory virus has received, that being COVID-19, there is still one virus that always seems to come back and remind us who is boss, or remind us who is the king of the respiratory viruses, and that is influenza. The flu has been a recurrent guest on the viral stage for centuries, contributing not only to pandemics like the one in 1918 that contributed to an estimated 50 million deaths worldwide, but also causing annual epidemics that leaves millions suffering in bed every year. So why is this virus so relentless? What makes the influenza virus capable of mutating and changing so quickly? Well, in today's video, we're going to answer these questions and discuss why this virus is considered by many to be the king of the respiratory viruses, plus discuss how it spreads, what it does to your body once inside, and even talk about effective treatment and preventative strategies. It's gonna be a feverish one. So let's do this. The influenza virus is one of many respiratory viruses, and the influenza virus contains RNA, meaning its genetic material is made of ribonucleic acid. This virus is notorious for its ability to mutate rapidly, which is why new flu strains emerge each season, and I'll explain how that occurs in just a second. But influenza viruses are classified into four main types, A, B, C, and D. Influenza C infections typically cause mild illness and are not thought to cause human epidemics. Influenza D viruses primarily affect animals and are not known to infect people. However, influenza A and B cause seasonal epidemics of disease in humans, most commonly referred to as flu season, which takes place from October to March in the Northern Hemisphere, but April to September in the Southern Hemisphere. But typically, influenza A is the most serious as this is the only influenza type known to cause global influenza pandemics, which occurs when a new influenza A virus emerges that has the ability to spread more efficiently among humans, which again, we'll cover when we discuss why this virus can mutate or change so rapidly. So how does the influenza virus spread and infect humans? Well, typically the virus is spread when you inhale respiratory droplets that are generously donated from an infected person. And respiratory droplets are just tiny particles that can be expelled from the body when someone talks, coughs, or sneezes. And if these respiratory droplets are brought into the respiratory passageways and contact the mucous membranes that you can see here of that recipient, that person can now become infected. Spread can also occur if a person touches a surface contaminated with respiratory secretions that contain the virus, and then that person touches their eyes, nose, or mouth. But the key to the virus's ability to infect other cells lies in its surface spike proteins. Influenza A viruses are divided into subtypes based on two surface spike proteins, hemagglutinin, abbreviated with an H, and neuraminidase, abbreviated with an N. There are 18 different H subtypes, H1 through H18, and 11 different N subtypes, N1 through N11. So you could get multiple different combinations or subtypes here. And maybe you've heard of certain subtypes or strains of flu, such as H3N2 or H1N1, which H1N1 is also known as swine flu. But as the virus enters your nose or mouth, it targets the epithelial cells lining the respiratory tracts. The neuraminidase actually degrades the protective mucus layer, allowing the virus to gain better access to these epithelial cells. And using its surface spike protein, hemagglutinin, the virus binds to the receptors on these epithelial cells, kind of like a key that fits into a lock. And this causes the virus to be brought into the cell in a vesicle made from the cell's own membrane. And so this process is often referred to as endocytosis. But once inside this now infected cell, the virus eventually uncoat and release its RNA, 
which will then be replicated within the host cell's nucleus. The virus also hijacks and uses other cellular machinery outside the nucleus to make other viral components, such as more spike proteins, that hemagglutinin and neuraminidase we just talked about. And once all the new viral components are synthesized, the new influenza viruses are assembled and bud off from the host cell membrane. But something that is important to understand is that during the budding process, the new viruses become attached to or stuck to the host cell membrane. And if it remained attached, the new viruses could not be released to go infect other cells. But this is where neuraminidase comes in, because one of the main functions of neuraminidase is to cleave or break this connection from the host cell membrane. And this final step allows potentially thousands of new viruses to leave and infect other cells. But keep this function of neuraminidase in mind when we talk about treatment options for the flu. But let's get into how and why the influenza virus can mutate or change so quickly. But with all this talk about the flu virus and with flu season upon us, supporting your immune health is more important than ever. And so this would be a great time to say thank you to the sponsor of today's video, AG1. AG1 is a daily foundational nutrition supplement backed by research studies and is packed with vitamins, minerals, probiotics, superfoods, and adaptogens, all designed to support whole body health. I drink AG1 as part of my morning ritual and it's an all-in-one solution. So instead of juggling multiple supplements, I just take one scoop, mix it with water, shake it up, and I'm good to go. AG1 supports immune health with key ingredients like vitamin C and zinc. Plus it also includes ingredients such as prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes to help promote gut health. And in a recent research study, AG1 doubled the levels of healthy gut bacteria. These healthy bacteria help break down food, alleviate bloating, promote digestive regularity, and having a healthy gut microbiome can also help bolster the immune system. So it's definitely nice to see that AG1 is constantly putting their formula to the test to ensure continuous improvements. So if you're interested, go to drinkag1.com slash human anatomy to get a free bottle of vitamin D3, K2, plus five extra travel packets of AG1 with your first purchase. That info will also be in the description below. One of the key challenges in controlling the influenza virus is its ability to change over time through what's known as antigenic drift and antigenic shift. Now you've probably heard of an antigen before, but if you aren't clear on what an antigen is, an antigen is a substance that induces an immune response. These antigens are typically found on the surface of bacteria and viruses. Hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, these surface proteins on the influenza virus, are examples of antigens that our immune system is going to respond to. But how does this relate to antigenic drift and antigenic shift? Antigenic drift refers to a small, gradual set of changes in the influenza viruses, hemagglutin and neuraminidase. These minor mutations accumulate over time. Remember, one infected cell can lead to thousands of new viruses. And as the copying and replicating of the new viral RNA occurs, through thousands and thousands of replications, you can get subtle mistakes or changes in the genome of the virus. And again, over time, this can lead to small changes in the structure of hemagglutin, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, leading to new viral strains that may partially evade the immune system of someone that may have immunity to a previous strain. And this is one of the reasons why the flu vaccine needs to be updated annually to match new circulating strains. And I know vaccines have been a hot topic over the past few years, and so we will address vaccines towards the end of the video. But let's move on to antigenic shift. Unlike the gradual changes that occur with antigenic drift, antigenic shift is a much more dramatic and sudden change that can occur when two different strains of influenza virus, often from different species such as humans and animals, exchange genetic material. And if you look at this diagram, you can see two different influenza virus strains, one from a human and one from a bird. Now, what I didn't mention earlier is that the influenza virus actually has a segmented RNA genome, meaning it usually has eight pieces or eight segments of RNA. And this is important for our story here. And you can see that we've got those segments drawn in with this picture here. Now, this segmenting is important for this antigenic shift because let's say the human strain containing the gene encoding one type of hemagglutinin infects the same human cell as the bird strain containing the gene encoding a different type of hemagglutinin. As these genes are replicated within the same cell, 
what can happen is reassortment of the RNA segments that encode the hemagglutinin occurs. Or in other words, a new virus can get packaged with RNA segments from both. And now a new strain of influenza virus is produced containing the bird type and the human type of hemagglutinin, and therefore can result in the rapid emergence of a completely new strain of the virus with surface proteins that are unfamiliar to the human immune system, potentially leading to a pandemic. The 2009 H1N1 swine flu pandemic is an example of antigenic shift, where a novel strain of the virus caused widespread illness due to the lack of pre-existing immunity in the population. And both processes, antigenic drift and shift, are responsible for the ongoing challenge of managing and preventing flu outbreaks. So what are the symptoms of influenza? Well, this virus can cause a wide range of symptoms, which can vary from mild to severe depending on the individual's immune system and the strain of the virus. And after exposure to the virus, the incubation period, the time between infection and the onset of symptoms, typically ranges from one to four days with an average of about two days. And these symptoms typically begin with the abrupt onset of fever, non-productive cough, and myalgia, which a lot of people will refer to as just body aches or muscle aches. In some cases, the onset of this illness is so abrupt that patients can recall the precise time at which symptoms began. And this was actually one of the ways of differentiating flu from the common cold when it was when flu diagnosis used to be more of a clinical diagnosis before widespread testing was available. Other common symptoms include malaise, myalgia, which we already mentioned, which was muscle aches, sore throat, nausea, nasal congestion, and even headaches. Fever usually ranges from 37.8 to 40.0 degrees Celsius, which is about 100 to 104 Fahrenheit. And one thing that I think is important to note is that gastrointestinal symptoms, such as vomiting and diarrhea, are usually not part of influenza in adults, but can occur in about 10 to 20% of children. And so often when someone says they have the stomach flu, this is usually caused by a different pathogen. Most healthy individuals recover within a week or two, but the flu can lead to more serious complications, where the infection moves into the lower respiratory tract, for example, and causes something like pneumonia, especially in vulnerable populations like the elderly, young children, or those that are immunocompromised. And so these individuals may be treated a little more aggressively than those that are at less risk for these types of complications. And treatment for the flu typically focuses on relieving symptoms such as with acetaminophen, which is also known as Tylenol, or ibuprofen to help with the fever, myalgia, and even the headaches. And sometimes may include antiviral medications. Maybe you've heard of some of these medications before, the most common being oseltamivir, which is also known as Tamiflu. And because we've learned some details about how the flu virus works, we can understand how this medication works because oseltamivir is a neuraminidase inhibitor. Remember, neuraminidase help to cleave the budding new viruses from their cellular envelope attachment point that was on the outside of the infected cell. So inhibiting neuraminidase slows the spread of the new virus. It doesn't directly kill the virus, but you could kind of think of it as making it easier for your immune system to catch up faster to make specific antibodies to hemagglutinin. And so what this feels like to patients is that this may reduce the duration of their major symptoms by one to two days. Now, one to two days may not seem like much, but anyone that has had a moderate to severe case of true influenza, they usually will gladly take that potential reduction of one to two days. But one other thing we need to consider, because these antiviral medications don't kill the virus and just inhibit its spread, for most people, they need to be taken within the first 48 hours of symptom onset. Otherwise, they aren't as effective because your immune system will already be making some ground by fighting off the virus by day three or four. The exception to this is that those that are at high risk and may not develop a quick enough immune response, those people like the elderly, very young children, or those that are immunocompromised may be given it after that 48 hour window. And lastly, let's focus and discuss some preventative measures. Starting with some of the basics, practicing good hygiene, such as frequent hand washing and avoiding touching your face after touching unknown foreign objects can help minimize the chances of viral transmission. Additionally, if you're feeling unwell, stay home, reasonably reduce contact with others so that you can reduce the spread of the virus to other human beings. And of course, doing your best to maintain a strong immune system through healthy habits like regular exercise, 
balanced nutrition, and adequate sleep can give your body the extra defense it needs during flu season. There is also the flu vaccine. And obviously vaccines have been a bit controversial over the past few years. But the flu vaccine has been around for quite some time now, and most clinicians are quite transparent about the fact that this vaccine does not guarantee that you will not get the flu, but can potentially reduce the risk of more severe infection. And part of this has to do with what we've talked about and learned in this video. As we've learned, the influenza virus can modify or change throughout the season. And so the strains that are included in the vaccine are selected in anticipation of what they believe will be the predominant strains circulating during the upcoming flu season. And some seasons, we get it better than others, where the vaccine strain matches the predominant circulating strain. But other times, we get a greater mismatch between the vaccine strains and the predominant strains, which can significantly reduce vaccine effectiveness. So choosing to get a flu vaccine is obviously up to you and may include you weighing your risk factors of how likely you are to get the flu. Do you work around a lot of people in public places? Are you a healthcare worker? As well as your potential risk of developing more serious complications if you were to contract the flu. So hopefully you learned some cool information about influenza during this video. And if you're interested in learning about other viral infections, such as HIV, we'll link that here. Thanks again for supporting our channel, everyone, and we'll see you soon.